Good evening. We've kind of run short of uh, new places to be in the house because my house has only so many rooms. But we're back to the living room tonight. And we're front of the bookshelves that maybe that will give you the impression that we are doing something learned tonight. I like to uh, leave an impression, uh, uh, image, at least an image, because, you know, image is everything. So, uh, and I am going to need my glasses, which are just here. Or at least there's a pair of them. I've got glasses all over the house. So, let us worship God. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening and the day is almost over. God reveals deep and mysterious things and knows what is hidden in darkness. God is surrounded by light. To you, O God, we give our thanks and praise. Let us pray. Thanks and praise to you, O God, for the gift of your revelation of yourself shining at the dawn of creation, guiding us through the wilderness, leading us to the land of promise. You sent Jesus, light of the world, to be our way of truth and life. So help us to follow him each day and rest in him each night until at last we may come to dwell in your eternal realm. Open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to learn how you speak to us so that we may hear and obey through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Previously announced, the subject for uh, tonight's study will be worship and the sacraments and uh, try to understand a bit of what we do and uh, perhaps why we do what we do. And to get into this, our Psalter reading for this evening is Psalm 95. This is uh, known as um, one of the invitatory psalms because it invites us to uh, praise God. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his for he made it and the, the dry land which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and forever shall be, world without end. Amen. And our scripture reading for this evening will be this brief but very familiar passage from uh, the book of Isaiah, the sixth chapter. And you can probably uh, quote a lot of these words along with me. In the king that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. 
yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to do what I'm going to do substantially without notes tonight. For one thing, this is a subject that is uh, near and dear to my heart. Worship and the sacraments. Every minister has a hobby in worship and uh, the worship and the sacraments would um, certainly be mine. By hobby, I mean something that we emphasize, something that uh, is meaningful to us and we find ourselves giving more time and, and more attention. Uh, and that probably revolves around its perceived importance, at least for me. And so the danger, of course, uh, in this is that without <laughs> notes to keep me on track, we may go for a while, but I'm going to attempt to be succinct tonight and we'll see how it goes. Worship in the Presbyterian Church, worship is certainly not an accident in the Presbyterian Church that it, it has a, a number of things that really converge to make it what it is. And uh, I'm going to admit because I know frankly that Worship is not, uh, does not fit the popular tastes, and so some may feel that it is not relevant, but it is to us, and for these reasons. The number of, of, of different things that converge together to make our worship like it is, is it first of all is biblical, that we achieve the outline of our worship from biblical sources and this passage that I read tonight, which I'm going to use as an outline because it is for Presbyterians and many others, the outline for worship. And that is the passage, of course, from Isaiah 6. Then uh, worship uh, has a kind of a, a traditional quality that, that, that is to say uh, that's not talking about the way in which we do things, but it is talking about uh, that uh, the traditions first of the Jewish faith and then the early church and then the Reformation and all of this come together uh, to make uh, worship what it is. And I just mentioned uh, uh, traditional that uh, I just mentioned the Reformation. The Reformation had three main battle cries. I'm not going to bother you with Latin tonight, uh, but it is just that only uh, through grace, only by faith, only from Scripture. Those are the battle cries of the Reformation. They are the emphases of the Reformation. And so they're part of what we do as we come together on Sunday morning as a gathering and do what we do. Our worship is uh, also has an ecumenical quality to it. Our worship uh, looks a whole lot like worship in other Christian communions, um, all the way from the Catholic uh, Church itself, from which most of us derive in some form or fashion by way of the Reformation, and uh, but it also bears resemblance to what other mainline churches particularly are doing. It may not resemble those that uh, have what I call a Genesis 1 approach that um, without form and void, but that's just my, my personal 
prejudice, or at least it's my personal belief. And finally, our worship is constitutional. We have, uh, as a part of our book of worship, we have a directory for worship. And nobody, nowhere, tells Presbyterians what they must do to worship or how they must worship. We have a directory for worship which gives us the principles of worship. And then by our General Assembly Office of Worship, we have a book of common worship, the first of which was began in 1906, which is the first time they had a book of common worship. And it has derived down to the uh, latest one that we have, which is you know, I, the, the hymnal was 2013. I'm, assume, I'm assuming the Book of Common Worship, the latest one, was just about that as well. Um, in any case, that what those books do is interpret for us that if we took the precepts and the principles out of the directory for worship and we put them into a format, that's what it would look like. And again, it looks like... Uh, many other churches which have at least worship that has some kind of a form to it. I have a uh, Methodist minister friend who told me years ago of a woman that came to him that he had not always been a Methodist and so like most uh, converts that uh, he wanted to uh, observe the Methodist traditions, the Wesleyan tradition of their worship. And so he had been. And so this dear lady came to him one day and said, you know, I wonder if we could uh, just worship like like we, we used to. You know, when we had three hymns in a row and a long prayer and a sermon. And so for that lady and for many people that worship, uh, it had a definite liturgy, but it had to do with three hymns in a row and a long prayer and uh, a sermon. Well, ours is uh, uh, based on uh, a bit more than that. And so why don't we start out by talking about Isaiah 6? Because this is where both the worship of the synagogue the worship of the early church and uh, the worship of the Reformation. This is where uh, all of it uh, came from. Isaiah 6 gives uh, Isaiah's experience in the temple. It talks about somewhat the framework around the call of one of the major prophets uh, of uh, the, the Jewish and the, therefore our tradition. And so let's look at the outline. There's a four part movement in it. And at first part, it says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Presbyterians have always been pretty big on this first element of worship. Uh, our Westminster Confession of Faith, the, the old one, uh, began to say, what is the chief end of humankind? And that is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's something that people always used to know by heart. But worship begins in praise. And what is praise? Well, it's opening our hearts and our beings and ourselves to God and praise God for who God is. And this is important to us. I have a, a, a collection of hymnals. This is a hymnal uh, that of uh, an evangelical group, and I just recently acquired it because it, it has some songs in it that are old. I mean, this is uh, dated uh, 1951. But uh, there are a lot of folks that are still singing those songs, and they are, uh, some of them, definitely fun to sing. And they definitely engage the emotional side of our, viewing, of our being. Now, all music does that, but music that it, it has one of those things where a text and a, and a tune should be 
wed together and sometimes many hymns are more successful at that than others. By the way, you do know that most of the hymns, at least our traditional hymns, came as poetry. And they were, may or may not have been written to the tune that we're used to singing it to. And some of our, uh, the, the tying together of the mood of the text, uh, the words and the music, the, the uh, tune itself, is more successful than others. And there's a lot of stories that I could tell and I could chase a rabbit and I said I wasn't going to do that. But I look through this hymnal and I've, I've listened to some of the people on YouTube that are singing from it and, and it is it is fun to sing from. But you know what? Most of the hymns are heavy on human experience and they're heavy on this idea of uh, this, this personal my, my God, my Savior, and me, and what can my Savior do for me? What has God done for me? Uh, where am I going? What should I do? But if you notice those pronouns, they all have to do with me and I. And uh, I'm really not saying there's anything wrong with that, but in terms of hymns of praise, I look through the index here and I've become familiar with a lot of the things that are are in here and there's some some things that would be profitable for even us to sing in worship but there is one hymn of praise in this that uh, that I know of I'm trying to look and see there's 400 and um, 410 hymns in this book there's one hymn of praise. And that is the one that's based on this uh, thing that we read, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. On the other hand, this is our latest hymnal, the Glory to God. Um, it has uh, a bunch more hymns in it, so it can be a little bit more of a versatile book. And honestly, I don't know how many that it has, but uh, I'm sitting at page, uh, looks like there are 853, which means you can have a wider variety of music, but if you look at the topical index here, and the longest section that is in it is the section that is entitled Praise, and it takes a, about a it, it takes, well, well over a half page, and then there are a lot of other things. So Presbyterians spend a lot of time and effort and emphasis in our worship in praising God, not just because of what God has done for me, and God does a lot for me, not because just because of God's grace to me, but God does show grace to me, but sometimes that we need to just praise God, not because me or I have anything to do with it, but because God in all of his sovereign glory uh, deserves that, and we need to observe it. So, that the first element in a Presbyterian service is a note of praise, whether that can be done by hymns or psalms or, or scripture verses or prayers or whatever, but we begin first of all with praise and uh, ideally it doesn't uh, have a lot to do with, um, with the I and me. That's legitimate and we can do it later uh, in, the, in the service because in a well-rounded service we may have been a little bit too much uh, praise oriented. Maybe we didn't have enough of those hymns of exhortation or human experience or whatever. Well, anyway, step two then. Once we have come to God in praise, which means that what did Isaiah do? He looked up and saw the Lord high and lifted up. Then he looked at himself. He said, woe is me. I'm unclean and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So the second movement of Presbyterian worship 
is usually some kind of act or mood of uh, confession. And that's not just to start the service groveling in there. You know, there was a hymn that used to have the words in, would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? I once heard a Methodist minister named Charles Allen who said, I may be a worm, but I don't want to sing about it. So we're not, we're not groveling in there and suggesting that we really should be living under a rock. What we are suggesting is, you remember the Beatitudes, the first one? Let's take the Beatitudes as we uh, have them in Matthew. And the first one says, blessed are the poor in spirit, which can be uh, paraphrased to say, blessed are those who know their need for God. In the Reformed faith, and that is the faith that was uh, begun in the theological tradition of John Calvin, that Calvin says that we're, ready not, we're really not ready to hear the word until we have a right estimation of ourselves. That is, if we have no, don't know that we have any need for God, then there is not a lot of chance that... Um, we are, are going to reach out very much or to dig in to the scripture. So the prayer of confession is given to really to enact what that beatitude begins. That's right, and right toward the beginning of Matthew that we have that fifth chapter. But it's because we know that we need God and we need uh, God to do something in our lives. Uh, and we acknowledge that. And once we have done that, then we're ready to hear the word. By the way, that when we do offer our prayers of confession and worship, we, wor we offer them to a God of grace. And so we don't come trembling, but we come boldly to the throne of grace because it is a throne of grace. And we confess our sins to God, knowing that God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, you've probably heard that somewhere as an assurance of pardon before. Scriptural. The third movement of worship is, and, and this is more uh, uh, abstract, that, that um, they took a coal from the altar and say, uh, now this has uh, touched your lips and uh, you, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. You know, what we get out of Scripture first and foremost is knowing that we are forgiven. And then when we are forgiven, then the scripture comes to tell us how we're going to live now as forgiven people. If we've received grace, if we have repented, if we've been reborn, how are we then going to live? And so we open the scripture together. And for those in the Reformed faith and the Presbyterians are a part of that, the central part of our worship is the reading and the preaching of the word and that's uh, we, we, we come for for other purposes but this is uh, the central uh, thing that we do and then finally then there was that verse 8 then I heard the voice of the Lord saying whom shall I send and who will go for us and I said here am I send me our worship is not complete until we've offered, well, we offer ourselves in prayer, we offer our gifts that, uh, that we, but we say that here's where the exhortation comes in, that we go out, that if we have come to God uh, with, and bringing our guilt, if we have heard of God's grace, then we end with our gratitude for it in the best way to express that gratitude is to Jesus said if you love me you'll keep my commandments and if you keep my commandments it has to do with loving one another and serving one another and making uh, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven all of these things that we hear but worship is not complete until we have been energized and uh, and challenged to go forward 
to be God's presence in the world, to speak as Jesus spoke, to do as Jesus did. And if we don't do that, then we are nothing but counterfeits. Though that is the uh, essence of worship, our sacraments, we, we observe two sacraments in, uh, because that were commanded by Christ. One is baptism and the other is the Lord's Supper. Baptism is something that is uh, given once. Uh, it is, uh, Jesus said, if you'll confess me before uh, other human beings, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven, and baptism is the symbol, the symbolic way in which we do that. But baptism, and there's some questions in our baptismal uh, office that, that really have to do, ha that tell us what, what that is intended to demonstrate and what this powerful symbol means to us. Of course, we use water. It's a symbol of cleansing. But the, the first question that we ask, do you turn from the ways of sin and that which uh, separate you from, from God uh, and the ways of evil in the world? There are different ways in which the question is done. So we turn from something turn from sin. The second question is, do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as, his, as your Lord and Savior? And then the third question is, will you be his faithful disciple? So we turn from something to turn to something so we can become something. It has to do with something of a new creation. We don't believe that baptism does it. The baptism is the symbol of what has been done. And as we baptize infants, it expresses a hope that uh, someday this person will make this commitment for themselves. But just as the in the old um, time that people uh, were marked by the covenant, the baptism is the mark of the new covenant, and it is the sign that we have, uh, that we are repenting, that we are trying to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that we have been cleansed from the old life so we can live uh, a new life. Baptism in the Presbyterian Church is done once. I, most of you know, I didn't grow up as a Presbyterian. I grew up in an evangelical church and we had one or two revivals each year and the emphasis on revivals was to get people to come down and make a profession of faith or a rededication of faith or whatever. But I had people that I knew of that um, believed that you could only be baptized when you were a believer, not looking forward to salvation. You always had to be looking back at it. And uh, so whenever revival came along and they were saved again, then they had to be baptized again. Presbyterians do it once, and we say that the baptism was not just for you. It was an act of worship of the church. It was by and for the church as it much as it was for you. So uh, if baptism meant anything when you first received the symbol, it still means that. Whatever you do with your life may be a renewal of your baptismal vows, and there is a, a service in the Book of Common Worship for renewal of baptismal vows, both for an individual or for a congregation. And uh, so we are not rebaptized, but we may uh, renew the vows that were taken at our baptism or that we took at our baptism, depending on when we were baptized. And I, I won't go any further than that. I'll just do, this is not supposed to be as lengthy as it's already become, but I told you worship was my uh, hobby. The final, uh, the other sacrament is, is the Lord's Supper. I say that as we look at the, the, the end of Jesus' earthly life and we celebrate that in uh, Holy Week and ultimately on Friday, Good Friday, and then Easter Sunday, we see two attributes of God. In the cross, we see the love of God displayed. How could God in 
Jesus Christ love us enough to submit to that. But on the third day, we have that other, we have the resurrection, we have the power of God. And when we come to celebrate the Lord's Supper, Jesus instituted that as a memorial meal. It was at Passover, and it was the Christian version of Passover on the night before he was crucified, so that he said that I'm going to give you something to remember me by, and this meal, based on what they had available for the Passover meal, is, is what it is. But there were in the old days that uh, the Lord's Supper, communion, the, the whatever we want, the Eucharist, whatever we want to call it, was uh, celebrated that as if there was a guilty aspect of look what you did. And there is, uh, uh, an, uh, there, there is a side of that. I mean, there, there is a truth to that. But we celebrate it on this side of the resurrection. So we know that it represents before us love and power and the transforming power of God. It is done with uh, common elements. And so we use common bread and uh, we can, some use wine, some use grape juice. It's all really wine. It's just a matter of whether it's fermented or unfermented. Back in the uh, New Testament times, it was fermented because that's the only way, if you leave grape juice out very long, you're going to see that it gets rather disgusting. But if you keep it as wine, it'll last for a long time. And so they, they were using wine, but we, we use either one, the fermented or unfermented uh, fruit of the vine, and we use bread. They were using unleavened bread at Passover, but the significance was the common element, we believe. And so we use what is common bread, and most of our bread happens to be uh, leavened. There are four views of what the bread and the wine represent uh, at communion, and let me just go through them quickly. The one is essentially the Roman Catholic view, and it's called transubstantiation. And the Roman Catholic Church essentially believes that uh, given the bread and the wine, the right elements, and then the right agent, that is the priest who stands in the line of apostolic succession, that pronounces the right words, which are the words of the, uh, that are given the words of the, the Mass, the consecration in the Mass, that these elements are, the substance is changed, they call it transubstantiation, the substance is changed into the body and blood of Christ. And when you partake of that, you are communing because you are really taking uh, Jesus Christ into you. And so it's sense that since they believe that these elements are literally transferred, tra transformed, into the body and blood of Christ, of course, they are given with a high degree of relevance. One step removed from that is called consubstantiation. That means like substance. And this is essentially the position that our Episcopal and, and Lutheran uh, Christians take. That is to say that um, uh, given the activity uh, that is given in worship of the Mass and that the setting apart for special use and by someone ordained uh, to the office, um, these elements uh, become not the literal uh, body and blood of Christ, but they become a like substance. Con means like substantiation, a like substance. So they are not physically the body and blood of Christ, but they are spiritually the body and the blood of Christ, and they are, are taken for the same purpose. When the Reformed faith uh, came along, that we uh, came from a different place, and that is essentially that there is nothing that any human being, whether they 
stand in a line of something or whether they pronounce words or whatever they do or, or whatever the elements may be for that matter. But um, the, that we talk about the real presence. So we agree with uh, uh, our uh, fellow Christians uh, uh, in a sense that uh, Christ is present in the sacrament. We all agree on that. Well, some in evangelicals don't, but we, we agree with that, that Christ is present in the sacrament. The way that in the Reformed faith and the Presbyterian Church is again a part of that, that we it is the locus of that and we believe that Christ is present in the heart of the believer so that when we having heard the word preached and by the way that in that that any time as Presbyterians we have communion there should be some reading and or exposition of the word and so because word and sacrament are two parts of the same uh, thing and uh, but anyway having uh, done that that um, we we pray the prayers they sound and have many of the same words that uh, our some of our other mainline churches are even in the Roman Catholic Mass it is that that we believe when that prayer has been given that the prayer is for us it doesn't do anything to the substance it changes it, it, it takes root in our heart and therefore that when we partake of the bread and the wine that that presence of Christ which is in our heart becomes real for us. And so nothing in our view, nothing happens to the bread, nothing happens to the wine fermented or unfermented but in the act of the church that is the the body of the church we don't uh, do private communion much uh, that we don't do private communion either because we believe that like baptism it is an act by and for the church that um, as we discern uh, Christ's body the church we discern Christ's body in the elements it's not the body, it's not the blood, but in that it represents for us and when we partake of it, we, like our other Christian friends, they, that we do uh, commune with Christ and that presence is real within us by the act of taking communion. So that's what that represents. Well, Worship and the sacraments, the word and the sacrament go together. Uh, this is why ordinarily that both baptism and communion are celebrated after the word has been read and preached. And that's just touching the hem of the garment but that's probably as much of the garment as you want to get into tonight. So why don't we uh, then complete, conclude with our prayers. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, O God, the lifting up my hands as an evening sacrifice. We rejoice in your generous goodness, O God, and celebrate your lavish gifts to us this day. For you have shown us your love in giving Jesus Christ for the salvation of the world. Especially we give thanks for the faith, the life, and the worship of your church. We thank you for the sky above us and the water around us. For people who have helped us this day. For occasions for our opportunities to help others. We thank you for the surprises this day that have blessed us. Gracious God, we know that you are close to all in need, and by our prayers for others, we come closer to you. We are bold to claim for others your promises of new life in Jesus Christ, just as we claim them for ourselves. And so tonight, especially, we pray for your church seeking to be difficult and 
and to be faithful in difficult times. We thank you for the gifts that you have given us in the worship of the church, in the sacraments, these visual things that remind us of who you are and what you have done for us and all. We pray today for our nation. We are in the process and we may not know yet what the final result is, but we pray that whatever we have done in electing a leader that we have done what can be used for your purpose. We pray for victims of violence or warfare or evil people. Uh, we pray for those who may be satisfied with rancor and falsehood. We pray for those who are hungry and thirsty, for those that are homeless, for those who face difficult times because of the current pandemic. We pray for those who work to minister those who are afflicted by this disease. And we pray for those who share what they have with others and for the healing of those who are sick in body or mind or suffering in spirit. Here in these silent moments, the prayers which rest within our hearts this night. Great God, you are one God, and you bring together what is scattered and mend what is broken. Unite us with the scattered peoples of the earth, that we may be one family of your children. Bind up all our wounds and heal us in spirit, that we may be renewed as disciples of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who left us this beautiful prayer which we pray our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may the, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all this night. Good night.